Okay, I, I, I was saying that it's nice to be back in Edinburgh, that I had uh, visited there uh, about eight years ago, and I have very fond memories of your lovely city. I, uh, I was privileged to go to the uh, castle and watch the tattoo uh, wearing a kilt. So uh, that, that was a lot of fun. And uh, I consider myself sort of an expert on uh, the history of Scotland, having watched a lot of episodes of Outlander. I'm, I'm up on that. Uh, you asked about Martin Gardner, and uh, you asked about whether there were contemporary uh, uh, writers who sort of filled his the void left by his passing. And uh, uh, the answer is I don't know the, uh, about contemporary uh, um, writers. I, I read very little. I don't watch the news. I don't read newspapers, et cetera. But, um, but uh, so I don't know that, but I wanna say a few words about Martin Gardner. So his influence on my life was tremendous. And th this is true of, you know, virtually every uh, mathematician and computer scientist of my generation. Uh, in fact, he not only sort of, uh, you know, went public with the RSA system with an article he wrote, but he had influenced my life way before that uh, because uh, in two ways. One, uh, he wrote, he also uh, introduced Conway's Game of Life. You're familiar with that? And uh, I was working at the Federal Reserve Bank, the main bank, national bank of, of the US at the time, this is like probably the very early 70s. And he asked the question uh, of what happened to a certain configuration called the R pentomino. And uh, so I had access to, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve System's computational power, right? So I uh, used it uh, to find out what happened to the R pentomino in the game of life. And, uh, uh, I wrote my answer in to Martin Gardner. I'm, I'm like 22 years old or something then. And, uh, and this was the first time my name ever appeared in print because I was one of nine people that Martin Gardner said got the answer. Uh, another thing that might be somewhat interesting to, to your students is Martin Gardner used to write articles on things like girdling completeness, and he stimulated me to uh, decide that when I would go back to graduate school, which I always expected I would, I was, had an undergraduate degree at the time, uh, he stimulated me to want to finally learn something beyond sort of cocktail conversation about some deep thing like girdle and completeness. And I did that. And that's where I fell in love with theoretical computer science and more generally mathematics. So extremely influential, wonderful writer. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I got into this area uh, around his books and his articles and what he wrote in the Scientific American. And obviously the publishing of the RDC method caused such controversy at the time, and uh, but has such, such significance. So around 76 was a special time and probably if we trace the roots back to cryptography and even cybersecurity, it was around the classic paper published by Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hillman. What was your thoughts at the time when the, when the paper was published? Yeah, uh, you know, th this may be instructive for some of your younger students that, uh, you know, it's sort of serendipity uh, that I got involved at all. So I was a uh, very young professor at MIT at the time. And I had two colleagues, Ravest and Shamir. Uh, and uh, we were also the same age, roughly. And uh, so we were very good friends. And virtually every day, we'd get together at MIT and chat. And uh, I walked in 
one day to Ron's office and he had this manuscript in his hand. And he started to go, you know, there's these guys at Stanford and they have, uh, you know, this idea of making a code and you could send messages and people couldn't read it and you didn't need it. And I said, words to the following effect, I said, that's nice, Ron, but I have some important things to talk about. And uh, so uh, at that time, uh, I was a sort of purist. You know, I wanted to do great mathematical things and considered anything that, you know, sending messages over an actual, who cares? And so, uh, you know, in my arrogance, I was not interested at all. And, uh, but since I always hung out with Hrvest and Shamir, they, he, Ron had enlisted Shamir. Uh, that's all they talked about for the next several months. Okay, so I'd be, you know, in gondolas, in Kellington Ski Resort with the two of them. It's all they talked about. So, uh, as we sort of understand in retrospect, the whole thing sort of moved into number theory. And they, they had come up with zillions of schemes. They were coming up with new schemes every day to, to make an incarnation of Diffie and Hellman's public key crypto system. And so uh, when it moved into number theory, you know, I didn't know much, but if you were wanted number theoretic algorithms, you know, I was your go-to guy, because that was something I was really interested in. So it moved into number theory, and they kept coming up with number theoretic versions of public key crypto systems, almost all of which I could break by examination. Uh, and occasionally, it took some real work to break them. And uh, there was this Passover dinner and Ron, as I recall, had a lot of uh, wine. And uh, we all went home at like 11 o'clock or something in the evening. And Ron called me ballpark at midnight. Ron, by the way, remembers none of this. So, you know, his version it might be different than mine. And since it is like 40 plus years ago, you know, I admit that I may be flawed, but I'm pretty sure this is what happened. So he says, uh, hey, Len, what about, and he describes what we now know as the RSA algorithm. And I heard it. And the second I heard it, because this was my field, I said, you know, Ron, I think you did it. I think this is going to work. And so uh, uh, hung up the phone. And I think it was the very next day I go into MIT as usual. And uh, Ron hands me a manuscript. And I look at it briefly and I, it's obviously this public key crypto system. And here's the interesting thing. The uh, order of the authors were Adelman, Rebesh, Shamir, alphabetical. And uh, uh, so I said to Ron, take my name off this. You know, you thought of it. And he said, no, no, you know, we all work for months and stuff like that. And so we had a little argument, me trying to get off that paper, Ron trying to keep me on that paper. I go home and I said, well, and then we agree, let's talk about it tomorrow. So I go home and I reflect first on you know, am I on sound ethical footing if I were to accept being an author on the paper? And I thought of, well, you know, I did stay up all night on some of these other ones that didn't work. Uh, so yeah, maybe. And I also thought, well, it'll be a paper that no one will ever read. And so I went back in and I said, make me last author. And that's how it became RSA. And uh, turned out people did read it. 
So, yeah. and it's quite a privilege for to have worked with such amazing people. Audi Shamir went on to produce wonderful zero knowledge proof work and uh, and crypto analysis and Ron. Has, has produced amazing work. What's your kind of memories of how they evolved after that time? Well, I don't know. You know, um, first of all, you're right. They are both brilliant, just brilliant. And, uh, you know, sort of anything they touch, you're going to accomplish something in it. Um, but in many ways, I guess after RSA came out, um, they stuck with cryptography very closely. Whereas I was still wedded to number theoretic algorithms. And my real passion and love since a child was generally science and math. So I just wandered around and did a variety of things. I'm, I'm you know, of course, aware of the amazing things, secret sharing and, and the like that, that uh, you know, Shamir did. Uh, uh, and, and Ron, by the way, is, you know, currently involved in like COVID, uh, tracking and stuff like that. So yeah, they're br just brilliant guys. It was a privilege to be back at MIT at all. And, uh, to have those two guys as friends and colleagues, the best. Amazing. And, and when, when we run our classes, we often talk about Bob and Alice. And we now talk about Carol and Eve and Malaroy and all these people. Tell us a story about how we've came to the names Bob and Alice. Yeah, now that's very interesting because I went to several years ago a uh, a talk on quantum mechanics. Yeah, can, I, can I get that? And and they use Bob and Alice now too, right? So it's it's you know seeped into there. So here's what actually happened is it's kind of funny. So when we were writing up that paper, mostly Ron wrote it, uh, we of course wanted to know what the very best algorithms to factor it were uh, that were known. And we wrote to uh, Richard Schrappel, who was an expert in the field. And Richard came back and described the best algorithms that are known. Okay. Uh, we, of course, sent him the manuscript at that time. And he also remarked on the manuscript. And he said, you know, it was a little confusing because, you know, I think of A's, B's, C's, X's, and Y's as mathematical variables. But you have these two agents, A and B which are not mathematical uh, variables. And so he said, I suggest that you give these two characters names. And then he went on to say, for example, Adolf and Boris. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and I actually, not that I was particularly fond of Adolf and Boris, but I never liked Alice and Bob. And uh, I always thought it reminded me of, you know, uh, books when you were a little child of, you know, Jack and Jill. And so, uh, but that's how it arose. It was Schrappel's idea and uh, Ron's actual choice. So now we have Alice and Bob and a whole crew of, you know, associates like Eve or Eve Strucker. Around the time that, that you, that you, the three of you discovered RSA or invented it, Clifford Cox and James Ellis at DCSQ were, were, were working on, on similar methods and so on. Can, can you remember the, the, uh, the background to, to that, how you discovered uh, the RSA work? I don't know when you know, that came to uh, my attention. It certainly would have been several years later, but uh, I I totally buy that Cox and et al. did in fact invent it. Seemed you know perfectly reasonable. I believe it's correct, 
And I, I always kind of admired those guys because, you know, they had a, accepted a role, uh, I guess, in, in British society uh, that assured them that they would contribute to the future of the country by their work, uh, but never get the credit they deserve. And uh, I considered that quite admirable. And uh, uh, so, and that's what happened, you know. I mean, uh, they, they certainly, uh, you know, deserve credit for what they've gotten uh, or what they did, but it was invisible to us at the time. So we sort of independently invented it as well. There's some great teams that have been created, uh, obviously mine well, uh, supervise you and Shafi and, and Silvio creating amazing work. What, what was it about those teams that allowed them to spark such amazing work that went forward? Was it the supervisors or were the students really feeding ideas to the team? What was the spark? Uh, I, I, first of all, I, I think, you know, the people you named are particularly gifted people. But, but um, I think a lot of it goes back to Manuel Blum, our advisor. Um, he was an incredibly great teacher uh, to sit in his classroom or to just speak with. He also, I think, instilled in all of us a few things. Uh, one was uh, the ability just to talk in a way that was clear to people when we gave lectures. And, you know, the idea that came down to me is, you know, basically, if you really understand what you're talking about, you can describe a lot of it to say a high school student. And uh, he, always, he instilled in us sort of plain speaking, you know, you don't start a, a lecture with, you know, let H be a Hilbert space. Okay, so that was one thing. The other thing he instilled in me personally was the following. I went in one day and I said, uh, uh, Manuel, uh, I think I'm gonna work on, and I think it was Fermat's last theorem. You know, I was a kid in second year of graduate school or something. I said, I'm gonna work on Fermat's last theorem. And, you know, most advisors would say, well, you know, not so fast, right? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. So, you know, it instilled confidence in me and I assume the others as well. So uh, yeah, he, he's the inspiration for all of that. By the way, you know, Manuel's advisor was uh, Minsky and uh, I am glad that um, uh, Shafi and Silvio won the Turing Award because I always felt the great obligation to have one of my students win a Turing Award. <laughs> you know, now I, I can share that responsibility. Yeah. And, and now we see uh, Ralph Merkel's work coming alive. And when Ralph was an undergraduate student, I think his professor dismissed his, his great ideas and he was supervised by Martin Hellman and uh, who also created Tahir uh, of El Gamo uh, fame. What, what is, is it around these people that, that have stimulated such, uh, such a great foundation for the future that, that, that many companies, many large companies now struggle to create as innovative solutions? What, what was special about those people? Well, you know, well, there's a, a long story and a short story, uh, but, but I think, you know, we, we were very privileged in our times, uh, people. We were allowed to, you know, live inside of universities in the ivory tower and, uh, we were given the freedom to do pretty much whatever we wanted. And, uh, and so 
so much of the burdens of life was taken from us that we got to just sit around and think is one thing. Um, and, um, you know, institutions like MIT, Berkeley, Stanford attract, you know, very smart people because the, you know, they attract the people who have worked hard and aspire to do great things. So I think it's just more a general process uh, that has evolved over, you know, probably since around uh, what, 1200 when Cambridge and things, you know, it's a process that has produced a lot of stuff and we are just, you know, current cogs in that wheel. But that's, that's sort of our job to think about the future and create things. So, you know, like, I don't know where Wit and uh, uh, Marty uh, acquired the vision that we'd all be, you know, hooked on some giant network and issues of privacy and commerce would be very important to us. When I read that sort of thing in their original paper, I said, nah, it's never going to happen. But they saw it was going to happen and did something about it. So, yeah, they were there. And, and I always wondered why Merkel didn't get sort of more credit. But I don't know the answer to why. It seemed to me he created a lot of very interesting things and, may, and, and really may have had the idea of public key crypto system. I don't know this, you know independently by himself. Well, it's, I don't like a, his legacy of his work lives on in blockchain and Merkel trees and DAGs. And I, I think it's, it's going to be the foundation for the, for the future. So obviously RSA is based on finding two random prime numbers, multiplying them to find the modulus. And that's worked amazingly for 40, 50 years. And no one would have thought that it, it would have lasted probably that long. But now it's under threat through quantum computers. So yes. what's your understanding of the time frame? What's the risks? What does the future look like if we do manage to break RSA? Yeah, uh, I am also, you know, I don't know if I'd say surprised, but, you know, gratified by the fact that it's lasted for 40 years and no one's broken it. I. I, I'm not surprised nobody's sort of figured out how to factor because I think that's a really hard problem on a classical machine. Um, uh, quantum, I have such difficulty getting a clear focus on what to think of the future of quantum computation. Uh, in my experience, there's so much hype, many times business hype around, you know, we've, we've, you know, created the new great quantum machine. And, uh, uh, you know, I look at these machines and I think they have a very long way to go before they're real quantum computers. And, uh, uh, but when I ask my colleagues, you know, is this ever gonna become real? I think they, they say, yes, it, it will. So, um, you know, just based on hearsay evidence, I think eventually, you know, quantum computing is going to be a real thing. It's the question, of course, is when is that eventually going to arrive? And it seems to me, but I'm not an expert, and that it, it's still in the distance someplace, right? Now, theoretically, I actually like the idea that factoring falls into P if you, uh, you know, are talking quantum because it's a much prettier picture. In the classical setting, factoring is floating between polynomial time and NP completeness, and it's none of the above, right? But in quantum, it just sort of falls into P and everything is nice again. So that's where I stand. Where, 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 what do you think is the future of quantum computation? Uh, well, it's, it's the risk. And I think in cryptography, we've always migrated. I think that's one of the strengths is that we've always deprecated and we've managed to cope. And even with your RSA paper, 
the the numbers you put on it said something like billions of years to crack. And I think these days with GPUs, it's, there's, the, the figures are, are quite uh, low now for cracking. So I, I think we will migrate. The small key sizes that you created are, are gone and we might end up with megabytes of, uh, of keys. So, so I think, I think we, we will cope with it, uh, but it's obviously a new area. Lattice cryptography is a completely new method for, for, for many people. So I think my, one, a question that researchers and academics often ask themselves is that why they continued their career in academia and why they didn't go into to a business route. So you obviously had that choice early on in your career, whether to go to MIT, take up an academic career and probably not get the salary that you deserve at that time, or to go into business. So what, what was your choice? Why did you choose academia? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, mostly I, I acquired this idea that what I wanted to do with my life uh, was be a scientist, mathematician. I acquired that uh, when I was a very little boy by watching uh, Mr. Wizard on black and white small screen televisions. Um, and so that's what I wanted to do. Uh, the other thing is um, I tried being a businessman. So I was the first CEO of RSA Corporation. And uh, one of the things I gained out of that was I learned that a great admiration for successful businessmen, they are no joke. They have skills and intellect and abilities that are quite remarkable. And uh, I also discovered I did not have those skills and other things in a remarkable way. And when I was CEO of RSA Corporation, uh, it was just horrible for me because real business people ate me up alive. And I could not wait to get back to the halls of academe. Uh, so, um, you know, it, I don't know what answer that is, but more generally, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to take any path, any career path, you better have the, the native abilities. You better work really hard, focus, uh, exert a lot of your energy, brain cycles and everything to it, to reach a high level of it. And, um, I didn't want to do that in business, nor would I have likely done it very well. So that's how I sort of came to where I am. And in your career, you evolved from cryptography towards uh, DNA computing. I think you're known as the father of uh, DNA computing, where you wanted to use DNA as a compu uh, computational uh, a substrate for our, right. our computing infrastructure. So what was your motivation behind that? Where did the work go to? And do you think there's still the potential to use that uh, method for the future? Yeah, um, so uh, number one, uh, the reason I stumbled into it is I have always had a, an interest, well, not always, but I acquired an interest in biology. And uh, I actually spent a summer in a molecular biology lab of a colleague uh, learning the techniques of molecular biology. And when I entered that lab, to me, it was, you know, finite strings over a four letter alphabet and how you could manipulate that. And uh, uh, so suddenly it was mathematics to me. And I was reading uh, Watson's famous book, uh, molecular biology of a gene or something like that. And uh, in it, he described polymerase, which I won't go into in depth, but if you looked at what polymerase did, you see a Turing machine. And uh, 
I, of course, with my background, did see a Turing machine and said, oh, these things can compute. Because one of the great lessons that Turing taught us was it takes almost nothing to compute in the sense of being a compute, a universal machine. You just need some way to store information and even simple operations on that information are enough to put together to program anything that you can program. So it was obvious that you could do this, um, compute with DNA in a, in a uh, you know, liquid, a liquid computer in a drop of water. Uh, so I did it because I was in that lab and I had access to it. I did it and uh, uh, I sent it off to science, not knowing what they would do with it, but it was very well received and uh, you know, it sort of took off. Uh, and so then I had a molecular biology lab and other people got into this field, uh, you know, and people ask about the future of it. Uh, I like that line, you know, it's not that the bear can dance so well, it's that he can dance at all, right? So I think the message for me is, and this has always been the primary message, that when you look inside of a cell, you are really seeing computation going on. I mean, it, not, not the only thing, but a viable point of view is this is a computer. And, uh, um, and so biology and computation are to me pretty much the same thing. And, uh, you know, life and computing are pretty much the same thing. And at the interface of these two disciplines, uh, there's a lot of great discoveries to be made. Hey, uh, Professor Buchanan, can I plug my latest book? Yeah, please, please do so. Yeah. Okay. That would be great. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so this is a book I've been writing. I started thinking about 40 years ago, back back in the you know RSA days. And uh, I've been writing it for uh, the last 20 years. And I, it's never felt quite right. But, but now I think it finally fell into place last week. And so I want to show you, I'll share the screen wow. book and then invite your students, if they're interested, to, you know, uh, send me an email, I will send them the latest draft and it's almost done. So let me, let me do it. Oh, host disabled participants. Oh, right. Okay, just, just let me enable that for you. Okay, thanks. Okay, you try that again. All right, good job, you've done it. Okay, so there is my book. Mm. Wow. Okay, so there's my book. And uh, it's got interesting, you know, chapters like uh, why do bees kill themselves, the resurrection of smallpox. And here's one that may be of interest. Why do we die? When and how will we die? Okay. So uh, if you are interested in that, uh, email me at one of those two addresses. I prefer the second. And I'll send you a draft. But, you know, uh, but I wanted to be a chain uh, uh, book or what a manuscript. So if, if you accept one, you're, you know, in order to keep good luck, you have to send it to five other people. So something like that. Anyway, that is my book. Yeah. And uh, if you've got the addresses, then I think we're good. That's great. Th thank you for it. I, I, I know what it's like to finish off a book and how long it can take, but uh, we look forward to that. So over yeah. your career, you've seen the tension between uh, privacy and uh, national security. So I think the NSA got involved with the RSA paper. 
the challenge the IEEE uh, at time not to publish and, and so on. And it's a very difficult question. I don't think anyone can really answer it because obviously there are bad people out there who want to do bad things to our citizens in our country. But mm -hmm. obviously there are cyber criminals who want to steal people's credit card details. So we know that we, you don't have the solution for this, but what's your feeling about that tension between privacy and uh, national security? Yeah, I, I actually address some of that in the book, by the way. Um, so, so the answer is, I, I totally agree with what you've just said. Um, yeah, these are, these are viable concerns on both sides and they happen to conflict, right? So in, in our sort of democratic world, what happens is at any particular point, you sort of slide the fulcrum either more towards favoring the privacy side or the national security side. And, and that sliding, uh, you know, it's a pretty good method when we're under great threat or feel that way, you know, uh, uh, for example, in a military way, we will tend to slide it towards national security. When there's peaceful times and abundance, we probably will slide it towards, uh, you know, personal privacy. But even though when I was, you know, sort of a firebrand or something, uh, you know, as a youth had thought I had the right answer, I no longer think that, you know, this is just a human process. Both sides uh, will fight it out for the foreseeable future. And it's probably the way of the world and probably the best we can do anyway. What, what are your thoughts? My thoughts is that we are technical people and we are here to protect people's privacy, uh, rebuild the internet, because I think the internet was built in a flawed way. So we are technical people who will do technical solutions that will always try to do the best for the citizens. But obviously we also vote <laughs> for our politicians and we live in a society, we pay taxes and, and, and so on. So I, I think it's difficult to divorce politics and, and personal viewpoints from our, our kind of technical approach, but it's, it's a difficult one because cryptography is 100% secure, uh, almost. There's no way that you can put back doors in a mathematical method as some government people think that we can do. There's a mm -hmm. magic wand that only works for them and not for E. So I think there's a lot of naivety in governments of the world yeah. that they, they can, they have a magical key that can decrypt ransomware in an instance and, and, and doesn't happen. So I think we've got a lot to explain our, our science to politicians and uh -huh. lawyers. Oh, yes. And uh, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's difficult. So it's, I always find it strange when I sign DocuSign and I take the strange signature that's nothing to do with me and I, I click on it and it becomes a legal document. And, as someone who understands cryptography, uh, it, it makes no sense to me. <laughs> of course, of course. I mean, I, I totally concur with that. Yeah. Well, that's why it's nice to be a professor. You know, you <laughs> don't have to deal with politics. Well, unless you choose to, right? Yeah. And Hollywood called you, I think you were involved in the movie stickers. And yeah. You gave some advice. Could, you, what was your thoughts uh, around that? Well, there were these guys. Uh, I should remember their name. They had made a uh, a movie called, I think it was called, uh, not Star Wars, Space Wars. And, and anyway, it was a big movie. And based on that, they got you know license and money to make other movies. And one of the movies they were considering was one that involved crypto, right? So they wanted to chat about it. And I said, sure. And they came to my office and they say, we're either going to make this one about crypto or we're going to make this one about these guys who have been locked in Parkinson's disease for a long time. And if you give them 
you know, this injection of, I guess it was dopamine or something, they suddenly come out of it. And, and, uh, and so I said, wow, that sounds a lot more interesting than crypto. <laughs> and they disappeared for a few years and the movie Awakening uh, came out, okay? So, but then after that, they came back and they wanted me to, uh, they were gonna make the movie on crypto, which became Sneakers. And they wanted me to, you know, sort of write a particular scene about giving a lecture as, as a professor on breaking these codes, you know, how, how would you break them? You know, you'd need to break through and factoring. So that sounded interesting. And they, they said, you know, they offered to pay me. And so uh, I said, no, 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 I, you know, I don't, I don't want to be paid, but here's what I want um, in return is that uh, my wife at the time, Lori, uh, gets a chance to meet and chat with Robert Redford. Wow. And because uh, he starred in that, this sneakers movie. And so that was our deal. I wrote this lecture, uh, which involved all sorts of really cool things, towers of, of number fields, and art and reciprocity law and all this stuff. And uh, I was going to call the method the... Uh, uh, function field sieve because I intended to actually write a paper with that title later, but for some reason I don't think I did in the movie. So uh, anyway, my uh, my wife got to meet uh, Robert Redford, and I did that scene. And as I, I've said in writing, you know, the I, I did get mathematical consultant, you know, uh, credit at the end of the movie, but the uh, but the Academy apparently snubbed me and gave the mathematical consulting Oscar to somebody else that year. So <laughs> anyway, it was a lot of fun. Do that, do that if you ever get the chance, you know. Yeah, but you it obviously is, got it's the Turing Prize. So that was as good as an Oscar in computer science. So, uh, so you, you won uh, big later on. Yeah, I, yeah, I got yeah. it, I was lucky. Yeah, you talk about uh, Gauss and Ua and, and you creating uh, amazing concepts that have never really been bettered since. So you even see that the Aracy method was nothing compared to what they did. Uh, what was it about them that, that created this, this wonderment? I think, he, you know, first of all, I, I don't think I ever said RSA was nothing, but no. It's just a personal point of view because, you know, on what you value and we all acquire different views. This is also part of my book. Um, and, uh, you know, what I valued was pure mathematics. And if you're in the pure mathematics game and you look at like what Gauss did and Euler did, I mean, who are these guys? You know, I mean, guys like Riemann, you know, Riemann wrote one paper in number theory. In translation, it's about six pages long. And if you read it, it's like he's, he's just explaining the solution to a homework problem. He says, and then we apply the new method of Mr. Fourier and blah, blah, blah. And of course it's given rise to the Riemann hypothesis all the prime number theorem and launched a large part of number theory. So I don't know who these guys were, but I do think the following. If I was around in 1800, um, you know, how many jobs were there for mathematicians in the Western world? You know, you, you basically got hired by a king or something, you know, or a duke or, or the like. And so I think, you know, what it would have been like applying for an opening in Europe in 1800. You know, you'd be sitting in the waiting room with Gauss and Euler and these other guys. You know, I'm pretty sure, you know, I would be doing something else. Uh, 
if I was, uh, you know, competing with these guys. I don't know, you know, just brilliant guys. I've got a question from Devi. Would you like mm -hmm. to ask us? Hi, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I've got my son who is a PhD student and he works uh, in the same and he's my inspiration waving at you. And uh, I, I, it's, he's my inspiration to do the master's course at this age. Uh, uh -huh. And it's a question uh, both, uh, both of us like to ask is, it sounds like Rivest and Shami were the ones who were able to conceptualize or imagine the possible solutions to the challenge. And you were the one who was able to translate that imagination to a mathematical solution. So no, can, I, I'll keep going. Can you speak more about the kind of discussions that would have taken place between the three of you, converting that mental image into a mathematical solution and how yeah. it took place? Yes, I'd be happy to talk about that. And, uh, uh, but I wouldn't characterize it quite the way you did. Okay. I think that, that, that what Ravest and Shamir did is one, they appreciated the, the quest, as I didn't. And uh, two is uh, they kept generating public key crypto systems. Okay, and this went on for months and there were lots of them. Every day, you know, there are two new ones. And, um, because of the way things went into number theory, my job became when they presented a new one that involved number theory to see if it, you know, even could last mild scrutiny. And most often they couldn't, right? It was easy to break them. So they were the makers of codes and I was sort of the crypto analyst, you know, like cryptographers. I was the crypto analyst. And uh, um, so uh, uh, that, was, that was our relationship. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I, I described previously, Revest finally one day came up with a really good solution. And I said, wow, you know, that one's going to work because I just had experience in the area. And so that's how we collaborated. Uh, the, the, the path from that sort of theoretical result and that initial paper uh, to becoming the foundation for you know, so much future work and so many businesses and things like that, that, uh, that was you know, a more elaborate process and one not involving sort of theoretical research, which was, you know, our great ability for Rivest, Shamir, and I, uh, but involved all sorts of business, and politics, and things like that. It was very, it was very fun to be a participant in that most of the time. Uh, you know, it was just fun uh, episodes. But um, yeah, but, but in terms of how things actually went, it was for us theoretical. They created things. I sometimes broke them. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Could I, could I ask Dan? Dan, uh, could you just unmute yourself? Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Hi, hi, hi Len. Um, I, I was interested in the, in the story of the clipper chip, actually, because I feel like what's happened over the last few years is kind of repeating itself, you know, with Apple and everything. So, uh, you know, I'd like to get your views on what happened, you know, as the whole Clipper chip saga unfolded, what were your thoughts at the time? Do you think that the NSA has had learnings from that affair? Well, uh, okay. So, if I talk about what I thought at the time, it's far different from what I think I should have thought about at the time. Like I say, you know, I was just what I would call a, a term you've never heard, preen warrior for the academic side, right? I thought, you know, individual privacy and all these things. 
And I thought the you know national uh, defense system, the RSA, I mean the NSA in particular, were wrong, right? I no longer think that, and I think more like you know what Professor Buchanan was saying. You know, these are both important issues. They happen to be inconsistent with each other. And we have to just draw, you know, the best uh, line between them that we can, and that will change through time. But uh, when Clipper came out, I was still a, you know, I knew what was right. And um, uh, uh, I remember thinking, well, that's not a, you know, that's a bad thing. And uh, by then, Jim Bidsos had been taken over my role as CEO of RSA. And uh, Bitsos is actually a great businessman. Uh, I like to say we both did about the same amount as CEOs, but his was in the positive direction. And uh, so Bitsos uh, launched this campaign. I don't know if you've seen it. He made posters uh, of anti-Clipper uh, things. And I think that that rallied, it was good political and business move that rallied great support and antagonism towards Clipper and it, it eventually disappeared. Uh, so it, it was really fun. I encourage you to look up the posters. They were really good and uh, a tribute to Bidsos. And, uh, uh, but as I say, you know, I no longer think that I know the correct answer. It just isn't that way. But you know, you guys are young and you probably still think, you know, you know what's right. And maybe you do, but it's just not the way I think about it anymore. Right. Thank you. Please. And um, Michaela, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, I certainly do, Bill. Thank you. And, and hi, Len. Uh, very interesting. So thank you for your presence. It's uh, uh, absolutely wonderful. You can give us your time. So, you, you know, you mentioned Alan Turing and, and his colleagues as well, of course. Um, and, and that's of great interest to us here in the UK. So I was wondering um, if you've ever visited Bletchley Park and the National Museum of Computing there and what did you make of the place or, or if you haven't, what, what do you think of it? And also very interesting... What, what about his work there? Because there's always this kind of thought that maybe, you know, Alan Turing was good or maybe one of his colleagues was the, the real master of it all. And I thought, you're, you're the person who's really going to, you know, be able to put the record straight, as it were. Well, I think I'm probably going to be the person who disappoints you. Uh, so, uh, no, I, I, I don't have as deep an insight as, as you have. I haven't bit visited Bletchley it's one of the things that I'll probably never get the opportunity to do. I would be very interested in having done it. You're suggesting, Dan, uh, uh, no, no, McKellar, right? I can't see. Anyway, are, are you suggesting that people think that Alan Turing didn't do the, the real work that is reported in, 19, you know, in his 19, what, 36 paper? The, the, yes, I, I have heard people say, well, he wasn't the real brains, it was somebody else. And, you know, when you get these collaborative efforts, you always get somebody who will stand up and say, well, hang on, maybe maybe this person was the real person. Or, you know, the, I, I, my, my personal opinion is he was, you know, a true leader and working in very difficult conditions and, and so inspirational. Um, you know, and I was just interested in your, uh, your thoughts on all of that. I've never heard that. I have no reason to believe that it's anything but a, a single person's work uh, in that 1936 paper. And everything that happened subsequently, you know, what happened at Bletchley and Turing going there and everything, uh, is to me very interesting and very important historically. But once you wrote that paper in 1936, pretty much was done. And, uh, you know, the rest was inevitable, I think. Though it's interesting that Turing himself, you know, uh, was involved in that. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, no, that's good. Thank you. you, you you've, uh, you know, sort of uh, un underpinned the, the faith that I have in Alan Sharon. So uh, that, that I can go and say, um, you know, to anybody I hear, hear who might say otherwise, uh, and I've, I've got it on good authority that, uh, that that position that he wasn't the driver is wrong. So that, that's fine. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, we've got a question from Peter. Peter? Oh, hi. Yeah. Uh, Firstly, yeah, thanks very much again, um, Len, for spending time with us. Um, I think um, you, you certainly seem to have had a very broad, varied academic career. And I just wondered, you know, as a somewhat of an accomplished polymath um, in numerous areas, I wondered if you attributed that success across those areas to a broad approach to problem solving, as opposed to a narrow, specialised, academic, deep you know, thing. And your thoughts on that? Well, I, I do attribute it to that to a large extent. And I think it's, it's an option, you know, uh, one that I chose. And, uh, you know, many people go very, very deeply into their topic. And, and, and you know, it's critical that people do that. But I've always had the idea that, uh, you know, real polymaths uh, uh, used to exist. A scientist wasn't a biologist or a biologist specializing in bacteria or a biologist specializing in bacteria of the E. coli strain and, you know, this specialization. You know, those guys in like, what, 1600, uh, you know, they were just scientists, right? Natural philosophers. And they did it all. And we've sort of uh, abandoned that point of view largely in the academic world. I think it's still totally possible to do it all in the following sense. I think, you know, someone can go to university and, you know, learn enough physics to understand relativity and, and uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, learn enough biology to understand, you know, the basics of protein synthesis and the like. Uh, learn enough math to be able to be feel comfortable proving Fermat's. Uh, well, no, that's takes a lot of time to get comfortable proving Fermat's last theorem. I've never done it, uh, but uh, you know, learn enough math to prove girdle incompleteness or to prove, uh, you know. Uh, what would be another thing? The fundamental theorem of, of calculus, right? That you can still learn at a, at a reasonably deep level all these great theories and, uh, you know, and learn enough chemistry to uh, understand, you know, how all that works in physical chemistry. You can still do that. And if you do it, um, you become a certain type of scientist. And what you can do from that stance is you can see connections that maybe others can't see because they've sort of siloed. And, uh, and uh, I think that that's a scientist who still, that's a kind of scientist, mathematician, who still has a place in our, our world and can contribute greatly uh, from that position. So that's sort of that. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. I've always found that approach very inspirational, you know, that broad, the ability to see two, two sides, three sides or something, solve a problem creatively with that knowledge you gain from different areas and fields. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got a last question from Franklin. Uh, Franklin, could you just unmute yourself? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Len, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. I have a, a bit of a question a bit out there, um, so please bear with me. But you, uh, you spoke about your view, you saw the relationship between biology and computing within the cell, etc. Do you have a view on the sort of modern concept of a digital reality that we live in? Well, let's use, can you elaborate a little more on, on what you're getting at? The, 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 the fact that people are seeing more and more as we go into quantum physics, we see they're seeing more 
on-off relationship between reality um, that we used to think was analog before. So we had people, you know, famous like Elon Musk is also saying, that, do we live within a computer system as if mm -hmm. we are programs? That's what mm -hmm. I mean by the digital reality. Do you have a view on any of that? Yeah. Uh, first of all, yeah, I got a lot of views on that. Uh, read my book. Um, you know, we're destined, I, I think, uh, to be replaced by computers. And, uh, you know, uh, I think computers and computation are going to be here long after genes and DNA have largely gone away. Uh, and uh, uh, I d for me, the idea that we live in a digital simulation uh, is fun to think about, but it's only gonna be meaningful if you can take that point of view and show me something new, for example, in physics or rigorously that I didn't know before. Of course, of course we can be viewed as being in a simulation. Okay, but I don't get much out of that view Someone's got to translate that into something more meaningful for me. Now, uh, uh, so, so yeah, that's one thing. Now, you asked about something else, but I forgot. Um, no, that's great. That's great. Thank you very much. I just wanted your, your view if you, if you were um, an advocate of that or not. Um, that was all. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, so th th thank you so much, uh, Len, for answering our questions. We appreciate you taking the, the time the time out uh, from your from your busy schedule. Uh, we thank you for for helping create the RSE algorithm and 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 obviously secured the world and made the world a safer place. So thank you so much. So if, if, if students could just unmute themselves just for one minute, just for a quick round of applause, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was certainly a pleasure. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll see you in Edinburgh or Scotland sometime soon. I don't know if Rich wants to just make a final comment. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, if you, if you like whiskey, we've got some very, very good um, whiskey in Edinburgh and some good places to go and uh, sample some if you ever managed to get across. Um, I don't know if you don't watch the news, I don't know if you know that. Um, the UK, we've just uh, created a brand new banknote with uh, Alan Turing on it. No, I didn't know that. Uh, no, anybody got one? To I happen to collect currency. Oh, wow. Like people well, collect a, stamps. It's a £50 note. So so Bill, Bill said he would send you a few uh, in the post. Um, <laughs> yes. It may yeah. be, you know, Five or ten, so I can give them to friends. Too. Yeah, they, they just released it this week. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty amazing, yeah. And thanks for telling me. Well, hopefully we'll push for RSA on a banknote here or maybe in a dollar bill. I think that would be a, a great, yeah. that classic that picture would, of you standing beside the blackboard would be amazing. Yeah, you know, uh, in this country, of course, we have Mount Rushmore. Uh -huh, yeah. Ah, yeah. So, you know, faces, consider, yeah. <laughs> consider one of those. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. but like, yeah, that, 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 that sounds great. Oh, that, thank you so much uh, for taking the time. That we really appreciate it, and uh, hopefully we'll see you sometime soon in uh, in Edinburgh. If not, we'll be over in a crypto conference in the US quite soon. Hopefully, okay. Thank you so much for that, thank and you. thank you to the students. Okay, bye bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.